Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray Wong. I'm a Hong Kong activist in exile. I fled Hong Kong in 2017 and was granted asylum status by the German government, which makes me the first ever Hong Konger granted asylum in an European country. Thank you, Ray, and I'm Anouk. Uh, I'm a research um, and policy advisor at Hong Kong Watch, and I work with Ray on um, advocating for Hong Kong in the European Union. And today we're going to talk about Hong Kong and Germany and the greater impact on the EU relations. Right. I think anyone who has been um, closely following the Germany-China relations knows very well that China's market is a significant part of the Germany's and EU's uh, market and economy. Despite the COVID-19 and the increasing ten uh, political tensions between China and the democratic world, German trade relationship with China continues to deepen. As of April 2022, exports from Germany to China are worth around 8.3 billion, and imports from China to Germany are worth around 16.7 billion. Germany had the highest share for China in its extra EU exports. Every time when we talk about China's influence in foreign country, we often focus on actors uh, directly related to CCP to China. But as Hong Kong has lost its autonomy uh, uh, following China, uh, years of China's infiltration and uh, implementation of the national security law, China is also using Hong Kong as a front man for its political gain. Based on the one country, two systems, um, many countries had given a special status for Hong Kong and treat Hong Kong as a separate entity when it comes to custom, trade, and other policy. The granting of this special status is predicated on the assumption that Hong Kong will remain autonomous after the handover in 1997, and the freedoms and rights of the people of Hong Kong are still in place. With this special status and the special treatment, Hong Kong has more opportunity to engage with the global market than China's, China does. This special treatment and status uh, from the other countries have been one of the cornerstones of uh, the uh, prosperity of Hong Kong. As an international financial hub, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's influence uh, on the economic relations between China and the world should not be underestimated. For many international companies, Hong Kong is an important gateway to enter Chinese market. And for example, um, over 600 German companies, branches, and regional offices um, based in Hong Kong. However, the, dis uh, the advantages that enable Hong Kong to be an international financial center have been under severe attack. Um, as Beijing furthers um, um, its grips in Hong Kong. At the same time, since it is gaining more control of the city, Beijing continues to exploit the special status of Hong Kong for its own political agenda. I will give you an example of how the special status of Hong Kong and Macau help Beijing to achieve something that is supposed to be um, impossible to alone by China. China's first um, aircraft carrier, Liao Lin Hao, was actually bought by a Hong Kong-based 
businessmen. And now this aircraft carrier uh, is uh, in operation, threatening the security of Taiwan and uh, uh, stability in South China Sea. This Hong Kong-based Chinese businessman was reportedly commissioned by the People's Liberate, um, uh, Liberate Army. And uh, the PLA commissioned him to purchase this vessel on its behalf. As the Ukrainian uh, shipbuilder didn't want this ship to be used uh, for military purposes, this covert PLA commissioner uh, set up shell companies in Hong Kong and Macau and told the Ukrainian um, uh, seller that the vessel will be used uh, as a floating hotel and casino. He succeeded in deceiving the Ukrainians and made a deal. So the rest is history. Without Hong Kong and Macau, in this case, China will be unable to buy this ship and to refit it uh, as China's first aircraft carrier and use it to threaten uh, its neighboring country. Hong Kong serves as a, co as a cover, not only for China, but also for China's authoritarian allies. Two months ago, um, when a Russian super yacht, this one, um, was stalked in Hong Kong, whose owner is a Russian oligarch, um, who is actually sanctioned by the EU and the US. The Hong Kong authority at that time refused to enact sanctions and refused to seize the yacht. As obviously, the Hong Kong government has to follow the lines um, uh, uh, of Beijing's position, namely not to side with uh, Beijing, uh, Beijing's uh, enemy. This sends a very clear message that Hong Kong can be an option for sanctioned evaders. Also, the interest from Russian companies to move their businesses to Hong Kong have been um, reportedly developing. Those Russian companies believe that Hong Kong could offer a window to outside capital for them, since yeah, Beijing uh, has a rather friendly relationship uh, with Moscow. They believe um, Hong Kong under the control of Beijing would help Russian companies to um, continue their business. So these examples show that Hong Kong has been and will continue to be a backdoor for China and a haven for China's allies to avoid sanctions. As Hong Kong's autonomy has been taken away by Beijing, the special status of Hong Kong that enabled Hong Kong to be treated differently is being exploited by CCP for its political agenda. Responding to the implementation of the national security law, the US government um, uh, in 2020 has uh, suspended the Hong Kong Policy Act that stipulates the US special treatment for Hong Kong. However, similar moves have not been seen here in Germany and in Europe. So now, nowadays, everyone is talking about uh, China's uh, potential invasions in Taiwan. And we all know that if it really happens, similar financial sanctions uh, as Russia now is facing will also be imposed on China. What Hong Kong will, what role Hong Kong will play when uh, such financial sanctions uh, opposed on China. I think uh, this is a question every 
uh, European countries and the democratic world should think about. Few months ago, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, so it's, uh, equivalent to a central bank uh, in a sovereign country, uh, has already uh, said that Hong Kong is preparing to deal with the similar financial sanctions uh, as uh, the Russia now is facing. So I will give the floor to my colleague, Anouk. Uh, she will show you a concrete example as to how uh, Hong Kong special status and Hong Kong is being used uh, for Beijing's political agenda. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, I want to talk about one unique example of Hong Kong's special status that exists here in Germany and in other parts of Europe, which is the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. There are 14 of them around the world. So they started um, as Hong Kong government offices uh, under British Hong Kong, and they were used to represent Hong Kong abroad. And um, gradually, after the 1997 handover, they were transitioned into Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices. Um, and as one country, two systems fails and Hong Kong um, loses its autonomy, these, op uh, these offices um, don't really represent Hong Kong abroad anymore. I would say that they are indirectly representing the CCP. Um, and at the same time, they still have diplomatic privileges and immunities um, in a lot of cases. And their aims are to represent and promote uh, trade and commercial interests outside of Hong Kong with Hong Kong. So they promote Hong Kong um, as a reliable trading partner and as a location for doing business. They have over 150 staff worldwide and a budget of over 75 million US dollars every year. Um, and all they do is manage Hong Kong's reputation abroad and review commercial and economic uh, developments. Um, and for many years, this hasn't been a big issue because Hong Kong's autonomy has existed to a degree. And um, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices have done a lot of cultural and business activities that um, have not been very controversial and that have gone under the radar. But since the 2019 protests and since the 2020 national security law, uh, Hong Kong's status in relation to China has drastically changed. Hong Kong is much less autonomous um, than before, and one country, two systems has ended effectively. And this is a gigantic change in a very short period of time. And I don't think the world has caught on to what this means for Hong Kong economic and trade offices abroad, um, and whether we still need to have representation of Hong Kong around the world, especially with these special privileges and immunities. Um, and uh, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices actually do a lot with their special status. So um, this summer, they were behind a Europe-wide campaign to promote the 25th anniversary of the Hong Kong handover, advertising how much better Hong Kong is now that um, it's been returned to the motherland. Uh, this is very much a whitewashing of what happened in Hong Kong in the last 25 years, um, and it's very much a promotion of Beijing's agenda um, for its own reputation, but also how Beijing would like Hong Kong to look around the world and how useful it is for Beijing, um, for Hong Kong to have this reputation. Um, and uh, one thing they did, for example, uh, they, they do a lot of cultural and business events. So in the summer, they um, organized a dragon boat race in Berlin. Um, this was to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Hong Kong um, handover, and it was co-sponsored by the armed forces of Germany, as well as multiple major German businesses. So um, for a lot of organizations, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices are not, it's not apparent that they're um, representations of the CCP. And this is a problem as uh, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices um, become more and more aggressive. Um, especially as Beijing controls them more tightly. So in the last couple of years, there's been reports of the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices calling journalists around the world 
who are doing unfavorable articles about Hong Kong, um, and they're hosting like alternative film festivals to promote films that um, match with Beijing's agenda about Hong Kong. So um, it's very much a part of China's international disinformation campaign as well, or counter-information campaign. Um, and in terms of business, um, the Berlin Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office promotes um, bilateral relations between Hong Kong and Central European countries. So they are managing um, the bilateral uh, trade, but also Hong Kong's reputation as an international business center. Um, they encourage investment in Hong Kong, um, and they offer services and webinars and things to promote investments in Hong Kong. Um, the Brussels Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office's Office uh, does something similar, um, but they also have a more diverse agenda. On their website, it says that they promote business with Hong Kong, but they also promote um, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Bay Area development. So this is even more obviously positioning Hong Kong as a wonderful business opportunity where you can get access to, to the China region. Um, and in Brussels, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office represents Hong Kong to the European Union. And again, I would say that um, this is like a second representation for China at the European Union um, since Hong Kong is not autonomous anymore. And um, similarly in Geneva, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office represents, um, is, is a representative to the WTO. So again, um, the CCP has two, two fingers in WTO um, pie and um, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and it's something that um, I think has gone under the radar because we've not um, noticed how quickly Hong Kong has lost its autonomy. Um, and by and large, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices don't do um, very controversial or um, uh, activities that go noticed a lot. So <coughs> there's a lot more that we could say, uh, but um, in relation to Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices specifically, we have a couple of recommendations um, that the German government review the status of the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Berlin. Um, and monitor their activities if the office continues to operate. Um, this should be clearly labeled as cooperation with the, the Chinese Communist Party. And similarly, in other European countries, um, the same should apply. And then in relation to Hong Kong more broadly, there's been a huge change in a very short amount of time. And we recommend that Germany and other EU countries review the status of Hong Kong, as well as their bilateral relations with Hong Kong, um, especially any special bilateral arrangements and privileges to, to ensure that Hong Kong cannot be used as a backdoor for China. Um, and as one country, two systems fails and Hong Kong loses its autonomy, we believe that Hong Kong can be increasingly used as a backdoor for Beijing to carry out illegitimate, illegal activities, uh, which could seriously um, damage the international order and peace, and we cannot offer to give um, Beijing this special place to do this. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Hi, thank you for the presentation. And I feel that this issue of Hong Kong in the context context you describe doesn't get too much light, so thank you so much. I'm with Global Voices. I, though, live in Germany now for one year. I really don't understand or, you know, study Germany. But it is my impression that German foreign policy is very influenced by the German industrial and, and business lobby. And correct me if I'm wrong. And so I'm wondering if in your work or, you know, other activists about Hong Kong do is there an effort to talk to actually to this business community, especially at the high level? And for example, let's just even you know brutally ignore human rights as an issue or as a starting point, but say, look at what's happening at Foxconn in China recently. Don't you think that you know investing and having companies and relying on the Chinese market might not be the very sustainable way? I'm just I'm just curious if there are ways to talk to those people who. I don't think are in the room, maybe I'm wrong, 
I wish they were, would be here, but thank you. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, uh, as far as I know, um, Hong Kong didn't uh, specifically engage with business leaders and companies that have operations in China, but Hong Kongers have been working very closely with uh, other groups, for example, the Uyghur groups, the Tibetan groups, and also human rights groups that are concerned with the human rights violations in China. Uh, I once worked in a German NGO called the Society for Threatened People. I know that they have been um, uh, in constant contact with, so for example, Volkswagen and Siemens to talk about their business in China. But um, so far, I, I, I didn't attend any of those of meetings, but from the result, it seems those um, uh, business leaders have a very strong mind when it comes to China. And yeah, so I think uh, we more Hong Kong and more uh, rights groups could expose uh, all these problems would be better to facilitate the change in German business environment. Yeah, thank you for your question. And if I can add to that, at Hong Kong Watch, we've just published a report on um, passive investments in uh, human rights violating companies in Xinjiang. So um, you can look at that or um, I can send it to you. Um, I think it's hard to talk about Hong Kong in that context, but definitely as Hong Kongers, we're working on that. And we are finding other language to talk to the business community and say, well, um, it's also a very bad financial investment to be, in, to be uh, doing this type of business. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, I'm Claire with the U.S. Mission to the EU in Brussels. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, other things we can do to support the Hong Kong people um, and whether or not HKETOs have a role in providing consular services to um, Hong Kongers? Um, I think we've seen since 2019 an increasing departure of a lot of Hong Kongers from Hong Kong. That means there are more Hong Kongers in the world um, if you can't go to an HKETO office, uh, where are you going? Or um, are there other kind of government institutions that Hong Kongers are using to be out in the world and to kind of raise some of these concerns? Thank you. Um, so I think a lot of Hong Kongers who leave Hong Kong do not want to engage with Hong Kong government institutions abroad. Um, Hong Kong economic and trade offices have never provided consular services that I'm aware of. They're really for Hong Kong's image. Um, so they manage the media, they manage reports about Hong Kong, they promote Hong Kong in a cultural and business way. But Hong Kongers, we have to go to the Chinese embassy for any consular services. Um, and and that's, that's a different question. Um, but in terms of supporting Hong Kongers abroad, I think that uh, reviewing and, um, and closing Hong Kong economic and trade offices is actually one um, kind of achievable um, a demand because uh, I think a lot of us feel that Hong Kong economic and trade offices are representing us abroad in a false way. So as Hong Kongers, um, the Hong Kong economic and trade office uses Hong Kong in its name, it is doing activities in Germany, and um, for a lot of us, it doesn't represent what we believe our city to be. It doesn't represent our values. And actually, they're promoting the Chinese Communist Party under the name of Hong Kong. And um, this, um, this is a narrative that, as Hong Kongers, we then have to also counter in, in our lives in Europe and in other places. Um, in terms of supporting Hong Kong good abroad, uh, as Anouk already mentioned, uh, Hong Kong abroad don't really want to engage with any Hong Kong official institutions. Um, and if they want to, for example, to extend or apply for uh, renewal of passports, they have to go to the Chinese embassy. But after the movement in 2019, a lot of Hong Kong at first, they didn't expect to uh, 
to be unable to go back to Hong Kong or to be in danger if they go to the Chinese embassy. But after the movement, they uh, and and after the participation in the movement, they realize that that would put them in danger if they uh, go back to Hong Kong for uh, renewal of passport or go to Chinese embassy. And now in European country, in Germany, there is no uh, lifeboat scheme similar to that of uh, Canada, the UK and Australia to offer a special way, gateway for Hong Kong to move to uh, European countries. So uh, if a Hong Konger who participated in the movement in 2019 in Germany and he or she doesn't want to go back to Hong Kong, the only way for he or she to stay here might be to apply for asylum. But Hong Kong uh, people, if, uh, if for example, in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, there would be uh, lifeboat schemes for Hong Kong that would shorten the, the waiting period and uh, facilitate the integration of Hong Kong people into a uh, new society. Um. I'll just stand up because we have a pillar in between. Um, so thank you, uh, Enoch and Ray, for the great presentation and uh, especially the recommendation. But I think I'll just add on, uh, this is probably out of uh, the European context, but like uh, in Taiwan, like the ETO, they actually taking care of the consolidating uh, issues. So, um, and unfortunately because of the creation, like because of that really strong um, resistance, resistance in, in Taiwan regarding, you know, the, the crackdown, um, to the Hong Kong people, um, like the, the office ended up closing, I remember last year. So right now, like after, because like the, the Taiwan border were clo it was closed uh, due to the pandemic uh, for quite a long time, but after we reopened right now, we do face a problem of not able to, you know, like receiving people with Hong Kong passport uh, visiting Taiwan, like as easy as it was um, before the pandemic and the uh, movement. So I'm just, uh, this is probably not related, but I would just like to ask for your insights on this, you know, uh, if, whether like what happened, uh, what's your uh, insight on you know how we can keep supporting the Hong Kongers, you know, especially regarding uh, their like relocation, especially in an emergency um, case. Uh, how do we, how can we support them better um, after the office uh, is is closed or have to be closed? Um, as as Anouk just mentioned, the, um, yeah, as, as, as I, I just mentioned before, uh, if there will be no lifeboat schemes or a special schemes for Hong Kong people to move to uh, the other countries, that would be it. As, uh, also it's a pity for uh, the Western world because Hong Kong people after uh, our experiences with dealing with China, uh, we, we have extensive knowledge or we have our first hand experience as to uh, whether CCP is a trustworthy business partner. And I think for example here in Germany, this kind of experience is very much needed. And as you uh, mentioned, Hong Kong people now are uh, leaving uh, Hong Kong and they mostly um, immigrate into countries with lifeboat schemes. Uh, with, uh, and yeah, without the, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. No, but no, it's okay. I think, um it would be fantastic if one day Taiwan would offer a lifeboat scheme to Hong Kongers. I think a lot of us would be very interested in going someplace that is so much closer to us culturally than Europe and also um, in line with our values. But at the moment, it seems like there's no Taiwanese lifeboat scheme available. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our time is up, but we can catch you later. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for listening and your questions. <laughs>